afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Jasmine Coley, and I direct the Critical Race Studies program here at the law school. And um, this is the second in a series that the law school has put on this spring on Me Too and sexual harassment. Um, and we're really excited for this panel, which um, will be focusing on issues of race, gender, and low wage work. Um, this is our attempt to recenter the conversation at the margins. As we know, a lot of, um, of the dialogue that's been going on has been around the spheres of entertainment and politics, um, but sexual harassment and these issues are not uh, in any way limited to those spheres. And um, there have been organizers and activists and workers and community members who have been working on these issues for a very, very long time. And um, we were really excited because we've gotten actually some really incredible people on our panel who have been doing this work and, um, and have agreed to come, even though I know that they have been incredibly busy. Um, so we're just so lucky to have them here today. And we are also very lucky that we have as moderator our very own Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, who really does not need any introduction. Um, so I will not even attempt to give her one. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Professor Crenshaw. And again, thank you for coming. Uh, and also, we do have a representative from um, Campus Care, which is, could you just let us know? Um, that what is, sorry, oh, I'm so sorry. I, of course, I waited until you took a bite to introduce you because I thought that would be appropriate. <laughs> Thank you, and with that, I will turn it over to All right. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, welcome, everyone. So, sexual harassment has been discovered. <laughs> Yet again. <laughs> Hollywood <laughs> producers have been shunned. Actors have become unemployable. Elected officials have resigned, conductors have lost their batons, journalists and TV personalities have lost their perches, candidates have lost elections. Campaigns such as Me Too have been repurposed to deliver the message now that time's up. Time's up for sexual harassment to be accepted as just another way of life. It's almost as if society woke up one day a few months ago and decided that the time was right to take sexual harassment seriously. But behind these headlines are some sobering realities, some of which Jesleen just mentioned. There are hidden truths and some marginalized dimensions of this particular form of discrimination. Dynamics that represent intersections of vulnerability that have contributed to this bifurcated conversation that's unfolding today. So on the one hand, sexual harassment in what we call high places has been driving the national conversation. Yet at the same time, the very concept of harassment emerged far away from the bright lights of Hollywood. On the opposite end of the spectrum is the home of critical consciousness about harassment beginning with the institutionalized sexual abuse that was a condition of work for black women since arriving on these shores. It's not surprising then that the resistance against racism that underwrote the civil rights movement led many African American women to understand sexual harassment as a form of race discrimination. <coughs> That accounts for one of the reasons why the first plaintiffs in many sexual harassment cases were actually African American women. It is an abuse that is tied to the long history of racist patriarchy in American society. Now, these breakthroughs were connected to the struggle for racial equality, not only um, through some of the agents, but by analogy and also by some of the judges who wrote some of the main cases that opened up sexual harassment. So um, the idea that race harassment and sexual harassment are parallel kind of ideas helped make the argument that 
harassment actually is discrimination when it's on the basis of gender. Civil rights leaders like Spotswood Robinson, who was one of the main architects of Brown versus Board of Education, was one of the judges who actually acknowledged sexual harassment as a form of gender discrimination. And of course, we cannot forget Anita Hill, whose courage made sexual harassment a household word, even if not yet a recognizable industrial right. So sexual harassment from the beginning has reflected intersectional roots. However, you would all be right to wonder what has come of that in this current conversation. So our roundtable today is targeted precisely at that question to amplify and where necessary redirect the conversation that we have to have in order to explore dimensions of vulnerability and struggle that have to be foregrounded if we can really realize the goals of Time's Up. So our contributors' bios are distributed, so we will not proceed with longer intros. We've also styled this roundtable, given the wealth of experience we have here, as a conversation. So our goal is for each of the panelists to make several interventions over the course of our time together, and then a conversation will proceed, um, hopefully, that will involve you. Um, so we're going to have several rounds. The, the first round will be about three minutes apiece, and each of the panelists will just give us a snapshot of what the face of harassment looks like in the industry that they are representing. We'll follow up by asking more about what kinds of dynamics make people who are experiencing harassment in those spaces more vulnerable. What are the factors that create this as an intersectional problem that has to be thought of in that way? And then we're going to turn to what kinds of activism either is happening, needs to happen, or should happen in order to address the, the specific contours of harassment uh, within the populations that each of our panelists are addressing. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what has been successful um, and what some of the barriers to success may be um, in, in raising these issues. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, begin uh, the conversation. I'm going to start first uh, with Alejandra. Um, in brief, can you give us a snapshot of the nature of abuse, particularly its distinctive dimensions faced by women janitors? Sure. So before the current headlines of Me Too, uh, there was rape on the night shift, and there was also rape in the field, and there was Me Too uh, that had been heard across the nation. Uh, but those stories of immigrant janitors uh, that come to work at 7 p.m. to about 3 a.m. every single night in some of the richest buildings uh, across the world were not being heard. And so when Rape on the Night Shift came out, uh, many of the women were saying, well, I don't know what the difference between rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment, and stalking is. Uh, we had a woman who had been violated uh, penetrated by her own broomstick. And she thought that ha that wasn't a crime because it wasn't, it wasn't rape and it wasn't the traditional sexual intercourse that she thought about. And so we knew that the problem was so deep that we needed to do something about it. But the, pro the, the issue was that they weren't speaking out. And they weren't speaking out because they are undocumented. They are worried and do not have faith uh, in calling the cops. And they are concerned about being separated from their families. So we started a campaign to say, ya basta, enough is enough. And to start going really deep with women, talking to other women and creating safe spaces for them to come forward with what was happening in these buildings. And what was happening is that women are being raped on some of these desks at night. They are being cornered in some of these halls where they are by themselves and where 99.5% of the foremen and the supervisors are men. And 70% of the janitorial industry is women. So we, we have a huge problem. Uh, this is a 
journey, not a destination. And so we have uh, embarked on trying to connect with other women in low wage industries to bring attention to this issue uh, within the janitorial industry in California and across the country. Thank you. Um, Millie, same, same question. Okay, you can start right now. Buenas <laughs> tardes. Uh, okay, I know you're all eating, but you should already by now have some energy. Buenas tardes. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to thank you for inviting me uh, or inviting us to be part of part of this important uh, conversation and. Um, Farmer Good Women, I represent Farmer Good Women. I was, and I come from a migrant Farmer Good family. Actually, one of the specific reasons why um, uh, some of us got involved, and most of the women that are part of the, uh, here in California, Lideres Campesinas, which means Farmer Good Women leaders, is because many of us had been um, abused, exploited in many different ways, and we felt it was very, very important to start talking and uh, uniting. So yes, sexual harassment has been on our radar since the late 80s. Not necessarily that that didn't happen before. To the contrary, in the 70s, I was a teenager. I should say I was a little girl, but I was a teenager. Um, uh, and I was working in the fields, and I was sexually harassed. I was uh, organizing with the United Farm Workers, but because that was an issue that you don't talk about, or the union wasn't even prepared during those years. Hopefully it is right now. Um, uh, it, it happened to me not once, it happened to me several times. I was lucky I was not raped. And um, the, the issue here was that not until the late 80s we found out through some needs assessment that women were talking about harassment, not necessarily quote unquote happening to them, but they knew that it was a very pervasive problem. Um, nonetheless, we kept talking and then we organized what became Lideres Campesinas in the early 90s and um, in, tr in terms of trying to talk about violence against women, what, some of the issues that came about was, uh, yes, uh, domestic violence is a very strong issue, um, uh, uh, sexual harassment and rape in the fields is a very pervasive issue. Uh, problem and um, we did find out in 1988 when we did interview uh, women in the Coachella Valley that at least nine out of ten women felt that that was a strong issue and then we found out with time because we did we did um, other other surveys and other needs assessments and uh, we found out that yes throughout the years nine out of ten women had been sexually harassed at least once in their lifetime during work. And 60% um, uh, of these women, between 50 and 60% of these women had been not only um, uh, harassed, but raped. And uh, I just wanted to, to share with you just one, one more thing. Look up Olivia Tamayo case versus Harris Farms in Fresno County. That was a big case that our organization uh, was able to, uh, the women were able to support out there in very far away and because they're, we're all always very isolated. Even if you yell and scream, we're, we're an hour or two hours away from work, from, from, at work from any place where people can hear. So, so Millie, let, let me just follow up and, and make sure we, we understood a statistic that you just mentioned. Nine out of ten women felt it was a strong issue and had also reported being harassed. Yes. And 60% who were not only harassed but also raped, 60% of those who said it was an issue are those women who also said they were raped. Yes. Thank you. Uh, from various uh, and different needs assessments. Uh, if you look at um, Injustice in Our Plates, Southern Poverty Law Center, I interviewed 100 uh, out of 150 women throughout the nation, not just here in California, and that persistently, the issue came out that way. Thank you. So, um, Alicia, as, as I noted in the introduction, sexual harassment in domestic context gave rise to the recognition um, that uh, harassment wasn't about uh, dating, 
It wasn't about, you know, um, the birds and the bees. When uh, people come together, they just are naturally attracted. Uh, the domestic concept and context gave people a greater sense that this was about power. Mm -hmm. So what has been the context of this understanding historically with respect to domestic workers? And what is it today mm -hmm. in terms of the vulnerability of domestic workers? Yeah. <clears throat> So I'm hoping that what you're understanding from the stories that you just heard is that um, you should be not surprised, but shocked, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that this kind of abuse, this kind of harassment, this kind of violence is very prevalent for all women, but in particular um, for women of color for whom um, we are harassed and violated while we are trying to do our jobs. And for domestic work in particular, I think it's important to understand this context because domestic workers who are nannies, house cleaners, elder caregivers, are folks who are working in private homes in incredible isolation, similar to farm worker women, similar to janitors who are working in office buildings late at night. The one challenge that we, an additional challenge that we experience though um, is that doing work in the home is seen as women's work. And so therefore, harassment and violence inside of the home mm -hmm. is looked at very differently. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at the domestic work industry in the sector, um, there are particular conditions that shape it in such ways that domestic workers are either excluded from most federal labor protections mm -hmm. or exempted from labor protections. Mm -hmm. And so we exist in this really strange crosshairs where it's, um, it's like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. That's the best way I can say it. And the, the, the way that that happened is through the result of a racist compromise mm -hmm. between Southern lawmakers and union leaders during the New Deal. So as workers were getting protections, right, under the law, black workers and brown workers, right, were excluded from those protections mm -hmm. on the basis of race and on the basis of gender, okay? So then what we're seeing now is that domestic workers, while the context or the demographic is changing rapidly, so domestic work largely was rooted in black women's work as a function of the legacy of slavery, now domestic work has changed demographically to be much more immigrant. There are still black women doing domestic work, but more so on the caregiving end than on the cleaning or nannying end. And what we're seeing in particular, I'm sorry, am I speaking too fast? Okay. Um, what we're seeing in particular is that um, even with increased exposure around sexual violence and sexual harassment, there still are not structures for domestic workers to bring their complaints to. There's no ombudsman. There's no agency. Because domestic workers are in this weird limbo zone where they're not even, they can't complain to what little infrastructure already exists. Mm -hmm. And so it largely falls on informal ways of holding employers and other harassers accountable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Maria, we, we've been getting a snapshot of what uh, sexual harassment looks like in the various sectors that are represented here. And so representing restaurant and service employees, give us a sense of what sexual harassment looks like from that vantage point. Antes que nada, buenas tardes y disculpen porque tengo muchos nervios. She says, uh, first of all, good afternoon. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just really nervous. Mm -hmm. En, en la industria del restaurante, um, en lo personal creo que es uh, um, muy peligroso para las mujeres cuando los dueños uh, buscan la manera de, de, de tener a una persona de esa manera um, en el lugar que ellos creen que esa es la manera de retener a una persona y no saben el daño que le están causando a uno. 
So within the uh, restaurant industry, a lot of times you have the owners of the restaurants that um, actually use uh, sexual harassment to be able to retain workers uh, in their place and to be able to intimidate them. En la manera en que ya a mí me fui pensando y pensando cómo salir de ese lugar era solo de imaginar que habíamos muchas mujeres demasiadas, tenemos mucho miedo a hablar y yo misma lo, te, lo tenía mucho, mucho miedo a hablar. En, mmm, tan solo de imaginarme a otras personas detrás de mí pasando por lo mismo de, de mí, eso fue lo que a mí me hacía pensar, tengo que salir y tengo que decirlo, tengo que salir y tengo que decirlo. So for me, it was really hard to think um, about leaving that place. Uh, but oftentimes I would, uh, I would look around me and I would see a lot of other women that were there with me. And even though I was really scared, I kept looking at them and I said, I have to get out, I have to get out, I have to get out. And uh, también, um, I'm sorry, um, mis hijos, los hombres, um, tal vez yo decía que no podía educarlos, decirles eso directamente porque me daba pena, me daba mucha vergüenza. Y ahora, mi, para mi hijo es nuevo el saber por qué su madre está parada, que viene enfrente, que viene diciendo a otras mujeres o llevando información a otros lugares. So for me, it was really hard to actually look at my son um, and my family and tell them what had happened to me. And so now he's one of the reasons that I'm out here and that I'm speaking about this uh, and letting other people know what is going on and what's happening. And gracias a, a personas como ustedes que se interesan, que nos ayudan, que nos apoyan, es como uno puede decir, si puedo, tengo que caminar. Si puedo, si hay alguien que nos dé la mano. So thank you to many people like you who are actually interested and who care about what's happening because it gives people like me hope that we can do something, that we can walk forward together and we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Manuel, thank you for also joining us. So um, a lot of people don't know sexual harassment also occurs um, across sexuality, that that can also be a vulnerable um, dimension of one's work life. So what can you tell us about that window into sexual harassment? Absolutely. I mean, um, sexual harassment does not discriminate. It happens to everybody. Uh, me being a, a queer person of color, being in the restaurant industry for 10 years, uh, we deal with a lot of uh, internal oppression and uh, we need to fulfill those stereotypes. Uh, while I was in the, on, on, the, on the industry, the stereotype that I faced was, or the box that they wanted to put me in, was the typical skinny, uh, uh, spike hair, flamboyant man, uh, that knows how to do hair and makeup, and was really funny, and supposed to I supposed to entertain everybody. So of course that didn't fit the characteristics. So a lot of people had a lot of conflict, and that translated into aggression. That translated into uh, them wanting me to submit to whatever they wanted me to submit, and and it's, we we develop this power um, exchange or, or um, uh, this power dynamics where I needed to submit and I needed to be, uh, understand my place. Um, you have to deal with comments and you have to also be uh, not that visible if you wanna be, if you don't wanna be target of this. Uh, we make a, I made a connection between the front of the house and the back of the house and the restaurant. Who of you are familiar with these terms, back of the house and front of the house? Good. Uh, so, for the vast majority of you, back of the house, meaning uh, what you don't get to see in the restaurant, uh, the kitchen, the runners, uh, some of the bar bags, some management stuff happens in the back of the house. The front of the house is what you get to see in the restaurant, which is servers, uh, runners, buzzers, uh, uh, the hostess. So, they're, they're two different worlds, right? Um, it is very, div as, as it is, when you enter into these dynamics, 
um, they're in, in huge conflicts. They're at war on one another. And so, plus this uh, in, internal oppression, um, it's just, you know, um, very easy to, to fall into this harassment and, and these practices. Uh, once you are able to speak up, a lot of times, since you're a man, or a self-identified man, there's no room for you to complain. You need to just suck it up and put up with it, right? And for a woman, they'll be like, okay, you wanna complain? Um, you're gonna be blacklisted, and nobody's gonna believe you, because it's mostly dominated by men, uh, or self-identified male on the back of the house, and, and, and most of the females run in the front of the house. And also, um, throughout these uh, increases of, of, of uh, of wages or these little incentives that they get, they create more div uh, 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 more division within the restaurant, and that makes it more difficult for people to denounce these cases and to be able to uh, uh, come up front and, and speak up. Thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. So um, I, I, I want to just give a, a sense of what we've heard so far and then try to move a little deeper. Um, one theme that seemed to run through many um, of the snapshots is the way isolation contributes to vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So contexts in which uh, workers are relatively isolated or contexts in which harassing behavior can occur um, without obvious uh, means or mechanisms to seek some kind of intervention. Um, I also heard that industries that are uh, heavily male dominated in terms of uh, the management, the immediate supervisors, uh, but uh, largely populated by women, a common problem in a lot of low wage industries. So I, I heard that. Um, and I, I also heard um, just lack of awareness about um, what is harassing behavior, what is abusive behavior, what is assaultive behavior, what is criminal behavior. So um, the knowing of one's rights, however unenforceable they may sometimes be, is still a, 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 at least a piece potentially of low-hanging fruit. So I'm, I'm hearing all of these as common themes. And what I, what I want us to, to think about a little bit more is, um, what are the structural characteristics of work in each of these industries um, that make certain populations more vulnerable? Um, and I want to ask that for, for, for simply the reason that many times when people think intersectional vulnerabilities, they think that intersectionality is a feature of the person and not the person in relationship mm -hmm. to the work that they're doing, the industry in which they're doing it, the, the availability or lack thereof uh, of means of intervention. So what more can we talk about, about each of these industries that goes to the structure of them, the population's relationship to that structure, that removes from them some of the avenues of resistance that they might otherwise have or need. So I'll start with you, Alicia, and we'll just go down. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I think there's a few things, uh, and I want to start off answering this question by talking about um, one of our members, June, mm -hmm. who is a queer Jamaican immigrant who takes care of an elderly man. Mm -hmm. And uh, June, in her work, uh, was consistently and daily harassed by an elderly man who had a whole bunch of health issues. Um, and certainly he depended on her for care, so did his family. They all depended on her for the care that she provided. And yet when June spoke up, and even when the family would see how the elder was harassing her, grabbing her, grabbing her in her vagina, touching her, grabbing her breasts. Now, mind you, um, not only is she not attracted to men, but this is her job. Her job mm -hmm. is to care for this person, and she's being violated in the process of giving care. Mm -hmm. And what the family would say was, oh, he's just that way. So imagine being inside of a home trying to do your job and having a witness to the violence that you're experiencing, mm -hmm. 
completely brush it off as if it's not happening. Mm -hmm. That's the dynamics that domestic workers are working in on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I think when we talk about work inside of the home, we are changing the dynamics of how people understand what is harassment, what isn't, what is violence, what isn't, because the work that June is doing in that home is work that is considered to be work she's supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. She's considered to be one of the family, and so therefore, right, not able to access the kinds of protections that someone else would get mm -hmm. in a situation similarly mm -hmm. that wasn't doing that work for pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you, and you've already given us the, the structural picture, namely this work, along with agricultural work, is generally placed outside of the conventional mm -hmm. frames for what employment actually looks yeah. like. So even as sexual harassment has, has been a difficult you know, sort mm -hmm. of child of discrimination to come online to see as you know, mm -hmm. a right, you place it in a context of... That's right the domestic scene That's and right. it's more like this is all in the family rather right. than this is a workplace situation. And may I say one more quick thing? Mm -hmm. So in that dynamic, what is she supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Because this is income that she depends on and that her family in Jamaica depends on. And so to also say, well, I'm not gonna put up with this anymore mm -hmm. means to lose a stream of income that you depend upon mm -hmm. and that other people are depending upon. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it does, it creates a dynamic that is um, ongoing and feeds each other in itself. And so this level of physical vulnerability is also coupled with economic vulnerability. And so if we're not dealing with the structural nature of why these particular workers are vulnerable, both from an economic lens, but also from a gendered lens, mm -hmm. then we're not going to be able to deal with the problem. Wonderful. Millie, what can you add to that? from the perspective of agricultural workers? Uh, farm workers work, as I said before, very isolated areas, and uh, the majority of the time going through many other issues. Um, if you know about this kind of work, uh, there's the pesticide issues um, being injured by that. Um, there's a lot of still wage theft. Um, um, uh, people going through uh, heat stress, um, uh, worried about losing their job if you say anything. Um, uh, then uh, discrimination against women, because there's still a lot of discrimination against women in the workplace in terms of if, if uh, you have to do twice or three times the job to prove that you can do the kind of work uh, so that they can keep you there. Um, and then if you are, uh, if you at all try to complain, um, you know that you not only will be fired, but because of your immigration status, because we still, we do have 65 or more uh, uh, population in the workplace that um, uh, are undocumented. And the first ones to know if the status of the person is the, per, the, the person that hires and the majority of the time, the, the people that are harassing or raping the women are the, the supervisors, the crew leaders, the, the owners, or someone related to them. Um, and, uh, or they are afraid that because they are threatened that they will be, uh, their family will be uh, hurt or killed. Um, and um, there's, there's many, many other layers of exploitation that workers go through. And because they don't have the information, uh, they don't trust this country, especially in this time uh, where there's this ill sentiment against immigrants. So it's very, very hard for them to trust the police and go to them. Uh, very, very hard for them to trust any agency because of uh, the connections that they feel that the agencies have or the connections that they feel that police has with immigration, et cetera. So uh, some of those are, are the issues and it's, it's very, very hard, not only for them to trust, but for them to um, even want to share it with anybody or if they say it once, they will not repeat it again. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Millie, this isn't simply, um 
you know, uh, false uh, fear. There are re there are reasons. There are real reasons to be mistrustful, right? Yes. Yes. Very much. And um, as I said, it it has to do with uh, the kind of um, uh, ill sentiment that exists here against immigrants. And uh, so, what the first thing that is seen in the news is how many times we're told, especially um, as the, uh, the sister here was sharing, that um, there's more brown faces uh, or Latinos working in the agricultural industry. And uh, because we are Latinos, uh, the majority of the time we've been uh, uh, told that uh, by this president that we, uh, our, our people are, are drug addicts, are, 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 are killers, or are abusers, or all this. So um, if, if, that, if that sentiment is still there, there's, there's um, very, very little uh, trust that our communities have uh, with anybody. So um, it's very, very hard for, for them to even want to, to trust other Latinos that have been here in this country. So, and, and I'm saying it because of our, our experience working with, uh, especially new immigrants. Mm -hmm. Alejandra, what about uh, the structure of work for janitors? Sure, so in your packets, in the purple packet, there's a letter uh, from Leticia Soto, who's a janitor, uh, to her attacker. And you don't have to read it now, actually. It's, uh, it is quite uh, powerful, but it's also very triggering. But part of that letter, she says, she had just finished being raped um, by her supervisor. And he and she says to him, you know, you know, you you dirty you dirty old man, uh, what have you done to me? I'm going to call the cops. And he looks at her and he says, here, here's my cell phone. Call them. I'll tell them what you did to me. And so that very real um, fear, especially in these moments in time when we're hearing um, that immigrants are criminals, and that feeling that. They are, you know, many of the janitors have said, I feel like I'm the cockroach. I'm the person that comes out at night. I feel invisible. People don't see me. They don't know me by name. Um, and where the invisible women of the night is, uh, is there, and it's, it's very real. And so part of that is changing that dynamic, that they do matter, that they are human beings, that they are workers, that you do know them, that you do see them. Mm -hmm. The other part is that this industry is mostly contracted out. Instead of building owners, hiring these workers uh, directly like they used to, now anybody can become a janitorial contractor. Mm -hmm. Anybody with a mop and a broom can say, hey, I'm Alejandra's cleaning service, and I'm gonna bid, and I'm gonna clean UCLA, and I'll do it with fewer workers, and I'll do it with all of these workers that I know that are from my hometown in Oaxaca. And what's happening in a lot of the parts of the world, and especially in Latin America, you have human trafficking, you have crime, organized crimes in, in organized crime in those countries. So we had one situation of another woman who's in your packet, where there was human trafficking, where he was only hiring women from Oaxaca, uh, from that hometown, and he would say, "I know your mom, call her. She was just outside doing the laundry," mm -hmm. and so he was raping and stealing these women's wages. So the contracting out world has made it really, really hard. And then the last thing, just to wrap up, is that there's a rampant underground economy in this industry. And so part of that, uh, a lot of these other panelists have talked about that, but it's the, it's the wage theft. And there's a lot of other issues that are uh, compounded into sexual uh, harassment and assault. Thank you, thank you. Um, Maria, there, there's some, sometimes there's aspects of an industry um, that contribute to vulnerability that m most customers don't even think about. So tipping, for example, um, having to rely on customers for a significant part of your wage also contributes to an environment in which harassment is a feature of work. What can you tell us about that as a feature that contributes to some of the ways that women have experienced harassment. In, uh, in el trabajo, 
era como el dueño era como saludar a todos con aquella sonrisa, con aquella amabilidad y voltear con uno como diciéndonos habla lo que quieras, nadie te va a creer, di lo que quieras y uno sintiendo esa impotencia, ese miedo porque él, hubo alguna vez en que una mujer le dijo le voy a llamar a la policía y él le dijo corre ve aquí está cruzando ve aquí a la policía ve diles y, y no te van a creer por qué porque tú eres inmigrante tú no tienes tienes social security dámelo no tienes papeles uh -huh. so um, there's the situation where you have the owners that go around and they smile and they greet everybody and they look really happy but then they look at you uh, and they say and they treat you uh, and, and they say to you, well, you don't, nobody's going to listen to you. Nobody's going to believe you. Go ahead. Look, go across the street and say something. Um, where's your social security number? Like, I know. I know you don't have a social security number. So, but go ahead. Go ahead and, and, and go over there and say what's happening. And uh, para eso era muy, muy normal en él, en, en hacernos sentir, um, aquí no cuentas, no, no eres nadie. No, no cuentan ustedes, aunque sí son mujeres y están trabajando para mí, pero no cuentan porque nadie les va a creer. So part of it was just making us feel and creating the environment where you felt like you're nothing. And he would tell you, you're nothing. Nobody's going to believe you. You don't really matter here. And that's the environment that, that we're facing constantly. Pero sí dependen de mí, dependen de estos tips que la gente les da, Dependen de este dinero y te tienes que aguantar porque lo necesitas para mantener a tus hijos. And, and yes, they depend, these owners depend on me, the person that's doing the work. They depend on the clients that are the ones tipping. Uh, and they depend on, on the, the restaurant being successful. Uh, it, makes, it takes all of us to make it work. Thank you. Uh, Manuel, you mentioned something um, that has been... Um, interwoven in some of the comments so far and in fact goes back to um, one of the significant dimensions of the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas situation, namely the fact that sometimes this harassing behavior takes place within communities and is packaged as just cultural, right? Um, so what, what piece of the intra-cultural, intra-community discourse around, oh, this is okay, because this is just us, um, have you seen and, and, and um, understand to be part of this problem? Um, well, once you, uh, me being a, a Mexican immigrant, growing up in Mexico, I left my country at the age of 19, you grew up with uh, objectifying women and seeing women as uh, being boxed in this category of they're just uh, made to, they were made to get married, had children, and be in the house, and uh, and that's it. They don't have any voice or empowerment. When we come to this country, and then we start in this low wage work, um, that takes a lot of factor, and you have that culture already given to you that women are second class humans. And also, uh, and anybody that can be different than that male figure, it's, it forms a secondary part. Um, once you encounter these low wages, once you encounter um, the disparity of, 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 of unfair uh, scheduling, where you have to be working long hours or three or four jobs, you are, we're apart from your family, this is a very um, easy way to, to to go and, and, and sexual harass somebody and, and that being okay, right? Another example of this is uh, the objectification of women in the workplace. We don't go too far, hooters. The whole, the whole uh, uniform is a form of sexual violence. It's, it's an invitation of sexual violence and sexual harassment because we're objectifying women and we're telling them that it's okay to walk around uh, the restaurant uh, and, and be targets for these men because it's a sports bar or these self identified men to, to do anything to them. And they have to do this because they receive these tips, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, 
in California, well, fortunately in California, we have a fair wage, but other states have, uh, as tip workers, you make $2.13 an hour if you're a tip worker. So you're fully depend on this income from the customer to be able to have its needs. And so if this customer comes to you and, and touches you and, and, uh, or tells you something that is unwelcome, you have nothing to do. You have, even if you complain, we're going to compromise your, your, your source of income for, you know, um, something that you can easily sweep under the rug, <coughs> your dignity and everything, because then again, you take this home. And, and then if your kids see this, it's going to become a cycle, and then it never ends. Um, and, and so I'll take moderator's prerogative mm -hmm. just to add <laughs> to, to, to that. One of the responses that is framed as a cultural defense of sexual harassment came in the aftermath of Anita Hill's testimony mm -hmm. in which um, many African Americans um, uh, saw her testimony as um, uh, traitorous, as treachery even those who believed that perhaps Clarence Thomas did some of the things that she said, there were those who believed that she was being disingenuous to complain about it because this kind of talk um, was called a down-home courting style, that anybody who was culturally acclimated to life as African Americans would not have been offended by, and most black women would have been able to respond by putting her supervisor in her place. And this wasn't something that was just whispered around. This was published in the um, pages of the New York Times by a distinguished scholar. So one of the elements of vulnerability isn't simply the structured dimensions, but the way in which sexual harassment, as it comes up in many communities, is seen as not harassing behavior, but as something that we, whatever the we is, just do to and with one another. Um, so moving to what has been done, what needs to be done, what can be done, um, I want to start with Alejandra to talk a little bit um, about some of the legislation and the mobilization that has been prompted sure. by the elevation of this issue. Sure. So the women janitors started a movement called Ya Basta, and this started three years ago. Um, and part of that was not policy as an end, but a means to an end, to changing culture in their industry. Because what they were seeing is that a lot of this harassment uh, and rape and assault is happening by their own male coworkers. And so, you know, and they're not Harvey Weinstein's of the world. They are, you know, many, many times it's relatives, many times it's friends of somebody that works within that industry. And so they really wanted to figure out how to change that. And so we had all kinds of people saying, oh, we'll talk to these experts, these experts, uh, UC Berkeley will do a whole study on this, et cetera. And we said, you know, we need to look at ourselves. We need to start from within. So we partnered with the East Los Angeles Women's Center and Mujeres Unidas y Activas in the Bay Area to do deep, dive into deep cohorts of women and men and offenders uh, to, to talk about what that culture looked like. Only they know, they are the experts, only they know what the break rooms look like, what their morning shifts look like, what the night shift looks like. And so part of that has been, has resulted in policy that's guided from the workers themselves. It's not in a box. And so we had AB 1978 that above a lot above other things, it mandated an in-person training every other year. That's going to be an opportunity to ensure that they don't just receive something in writing that when they get hired that say, oh, this is your training. And AB 2079 uh, that we're trying to get past this year is actually going to empower those promotoras and compadres, those cohorts, to become the certified trainers of that training that we want through AB 1978. And we believe that that's the answer for every industry from the bottom up. Thank you. Maria, what, what is ROC advocating for? What has been accomplished? What needs to be done? Creo que nosotros lo que estamos haciendo en este momento es llevando información a cada rincón, a cada lugar de los restaurantes, que la mayoría 
de las personas te, a, tengan acceso a esta información, en, sepan en qué momento pararlo, o, pero que de verdad ese dueño o ese lugar tenga esa ley pegada en donde lo miren los trabajadores. So what we're focusing on is making sure that at every uh, work site that workers have the information about what to do if this is happening. Uh, and we're also just focusing on making sure that it's incredibly visible so that there's something publicly uh, where workers know that this is not tolerated um, and, and where they can get help. Lily, um, the world has discovered <laughs> women <laughs> farm workers. What has that opened up? What has that allowed you all to continue? What would you like to see happen? I think, I think students here uh, would um, agree with me that uh, the same way Christopher Columbus did not discover America. Um, okay, uh, the same way. Um, you know, Farm Worker Women, as I was, I was sharing earlier, that uh, uh, we have been trying to organize and has been very, very hard to open the dialogue, but as soon as we, we open that dialogue and the women feel that trust among ourselves, um, with each other, um, uh, we are able uh, to, through Líderes Campesinas, which is the local um, statewide organization, we have uh, 11 chapters around rural California, and then uh, Líderes Campesinas throughout the years met women in other in other states, and we have now the National Alliance of, of Pharmaco Women, which is Alianza Nacional de Campesinas. We have 17 organizations, um, uh, groups that uh, joined the Alianza, and um, as we had in 2013, a, a convening of, of Pharmaco Women to talk about their issues. Uh, so, uh, one issue that we, we know uh, became a priority was violence against women, specifically domestic violence and sexual harassment in the workplace because it's a very pervasive uh, problem. And that throughout all these, uh, the, uh, we, we have not just done, and let me, let me just say something. The reason why, one of the strongest reasons why we started organizing is because we did a needs assessment for a thesis. Hmm. For Cal State Long Beach, this woman, um, she came from a farmworker family. She wanted to do this thesis, and it was with farmworker women. And uh, because some of us participated, it 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 helped us. The the interviewers helped us really become more aware of women wanting wanting not to just uh, they didn't want saviors. They wanted people to really understand it and listen to them. Um, and uh, get together and do something about what was going on in their lives. And so that's how Lideres Campesinas uh, uh, came about. And if you want to uh, also find out about that, uh, it's, it's uh, the Maria Elena Lopez Trevino, the one that did that uh, uh, thesis and it got an award in Cal State Long Beach. And just uh, uh, towards the end, uh, I do wanna share that, and I'm sorry about everybody, but um, that, um, Pharmaco women uh, grew out of, uh, of, of uh, the mobilizing because the United Farm Workers had started this kind of movement. It's, it's, it's not easy, but it's much easier to organize here in California than in any other states. Uh, because in other, other states, you cannot organize farm workers. Uh, it's against the law to do that. In here in California, we can. It's much easier. So uh, it doesn't mean that we are organizing to get a unions involved in the workplace because that's not our job. But it makes it politically, it makes it much easier for us to do that. It's been very, very hard. But um, uh, the organization is governed by Farmaco women also. So this means that we keep this this movement grounded, and we really uh, look at the issues, and we we uh, work around that those issues. And women are trained uh, so that they can also uh, be be the agents of social, economic, and political change. Thank you. Thank you, Millie. Um, Alicia, I'm going to ask you to wear two different hats. Okay. Um, you have many. I'm going to ask you to put both of them on here. Um, first, um, along the lines of what the uh, Domestic Workers Alliance has been advocating, 
um, and trying to do uh, give us a sense of what activism and policy looks like from that vantage point. And then stepping back, give us a sense of what you think um, the opportunities and the pitfalls of this particular moment might be. You, you're, you're associated with another movement, right? Um, and you've seen um, how just things unfold. So give us just your sense of how that uh, applies to this Me Too, Time's Up moment. <laughs> and I'm going to sit back. I know, I know, I know. OK, so let's start with um, what we do as domestic workers. So um, a lot of what we have invested in as a movement has been culture change and policy change. Because first and foremost, so many people don't even know what domestic workers are, who they are, what domestic workers do. I'm constantly having to describe, like, domestic workers are people who take care of other people's kids, or who clean your home, or make it possible for you to do other work besides work inside the home. Um, and so that means we have to engage in the realm of culture so that there are more images and there are more, um, there's more familiarity with domestic work as a sector, and then to humanize the sector as well, and be able to tell the stories uh, through the mainstream channels that people access most often um, of what's happening in our sector, but also of the resilience happening in our sector. And you saw one of those moments at the Golden Globes uh, last month with uh, La Alianza and domestic workers and farm, and. Um, Janitor, I'm sorry, restaurant workers. I've had like two hours of sleep. Um, uh, you saw a hundred million people um, who tuned into the Golden Globes suddenly learned about what was happening um, with one fair wage or what was happening with domestic workers or what's happening with farm workers. And that was important. That was a watershed moment. Um, so you had bloggers like Perez Hilton talking about, there's this amazing woman on the carpet talking about domestic workers, and I don't know what that is, but I'm going to check it out, and you should too. He has a huge platform, yeah? Um, I'm not uh, endorsing. <laughs> we also, because we're excluded from and exempted from many labor, federal labor protections, we have to fight for policy change at the state level. And we've been incredibly successful. So um, we have won eight bills, eight statewide bills, that guarantee rights for domestic workers. And now our work is all about enforcing those laws, which is a whole other thing. I'm going to take another couple of seconds. Um, and uh, our laws are incredibly diverse. So in Massachusetts, domestic workers now have access to maternity leave or the right to evaluate their employer, right? So we're able to also innovate on the floor. Um, I'll just say a minute about this moment um, because I want to I wanna complicate it a little bit by saying um, even though Me Too is a movement that many people are hearing about through white women who are celebrities, um, who are struggling in their own industry for various reasons. Um, we should just be aware that this movement was created by a black woman um, who has been organizing and supporting young women and girls who have been assaulted and harassed and could not tell their stories. And so that is really the root of where Me Too comes from. And now we have Me Too, the Hollywood version, and Time's Up, and we have all of these different ways of talking about um, this movement that really started with and was built for uh, women who have, and young girls who have been excluded from narratives forever. And the danger here is many. Um, so one, people are moving from Me Too, now what's next? As if, right? Mm -hmm. As if there's some easy card that people should just pull out their pockets so that people can move on to the next issue. And part of where that really comes from, I think, is that um, movements have become brands mm -hmm. as opposed to things that people want to become a part of because it will change the fundamental quality of your life. Mm -hmm. So Black Lives Matter is a similar thing. Everybody wants to be down with Black Lives Matter and take pictures with Black Lives Matter, but then when it comes to um, uh, uh, fighting for black lives, that's a whole different conversation. Mm -hmm. 
And now that, for example, Parkland students, right, um, are standing up and fighting for gun control, which is amazing. I think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, we have this way in which, because of the quickness of technology and everything being available to us in our hands within seconds, um, I think it also accelerates and skews our understanding of how movements are built, what movements are, how change happens, and who needs to be involved in that change. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage us, right, before we start calling things movements, to really grapple with, like, what does it mean to be a movement, okay? Um, and can you have a movement on social media, or does it require, <laughs> what does it require people changing their relationships to each other and demanding change of the systems and structures that shape our lives. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing being, um, remember that origin matters, stories matter, and origin stories matter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so if, it, if there's a way that we can use origin stories to help root us in context, it will also help us um, understand the dynamics of change that is or isn't happening and why. So again, we can never separate race and class and gender, even from resistance. Thank I'll leave it there. Thank you. So I, I lied to you, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I told you we were gonna have a conversation with you. Uh, and um, this has been so rich that we've actually run out of time for that, so I apologize. I hope my consolation prize will be a sentence from everyone as to what students can do to support the work that they do. So I'm gonna start uh, with Manuel and uh, come down the aisle. Just one sentence about what you'd like to see students do. I'd like the students to, uh, once they go to a restaurant, be nice to your server or your restaurant worker and try to understand them and tip them well. <laughs> and, um, and there are times that, you know, you as a restaurant worker serve as a psychologist for that person uh, uh, that you're serving the food to. And, uh, you know, there's a lot that goes into uh, delivering that food or plate to your table. So just be nice to your restaurant worker <coughs> and understand that, you know, they're, they're facing their own battles. Thank you. Sí, en realidad es una invitación no solamente a que no solamente a que vayan y miren, sí, simplemente a que también observen lo que en realidad pasa un poquito enfrente y un poquito detrás del trabajador, detrás del, de donde están las registradoras. So for all of you to when you go to a restaurant to observe more uh, beyond what you see, what's in front of you, uh, to actually look behind and know that there's a whole different world of what's going on. Muchas veces, si, si observan un poquito más, muchas veces esas trabajadoras, esas personas, detrás de ese trabajo que está uno haciendo, esa rutina, traemos en nuestra cabeza o en nuestro corazón mucho dolor que no podemos hablarlo. Mm -hmm. And just know that many of us are, have our own stories and there's a lot of pain that many of us are carrying and we can't talk about it, but, but it's there and we're there. Thank you. Yes, just I think challenging this notion that we're all created equal. It's so easy to say, oh, we all bleed the same. Uh, but when you actually see it playing out of even like in, on immigration, the deserving and the undeserving. Uh, and black lives matter, all lives matter. And this movement with a lot of feminists, it's been, well, it's all the same. I'm a survivor, your rape is the same as my rape. And the trauma could be the same, it can be very personal, but we all have our own privilege. And with privilege comes responsibility to say, yes, I'm a survivor, but I'm not undocumented, and I'm not afraid to report my crime, and I'm not going to be separated from my family. So just look at your own privilege and reflect on it, and help lift up somebody else who's being disproportionately impacted, whether it's because of race, whether it's because of immigration status, whether it's because of LGBTQI status, or whether it's because of the work that they do. Thank you. I would recommend you do more theses on farmworkers. <laughs> 
Um, uh, you will get a lot of support, not only from our organization, there's plenty of organizations, well, I should not say plenty, but there's more organizations that support farm workers or work with farm workers that can, can give you that this, this kind of, um, whatever you need. Uh, they'll even take it to the fields. The women are willing to do that. And the other thing is that I, uh, SB 1087 is one of the, one of the uh, uh, laws, uh, bills that passed uh, several years back, and it's, it's about uh, making sure that labor contractors train their workers also. We did a study and we found out in the Ventura County, and we found out that only half of the people were trained, half trained on sexual harassment in the workplace, and the majority of, of these, um, of, the, of, of the, um, the people in authority, the crew leaders, supervisors, of the people that were not trained, the workers that were not trained, they were not trained either. And so um, think every time you eat, please, think about farm workers. And help us um, not be just bystanders on any type of issue against our communities. Let's, let's not be bystanders. Just looking at what, or just hearing it and just, no. Do something, say something. You do, you're here, you can do many papers, you can do many, you can write. Use, use your writing to change the world. Thank you. Alicia. Ditto. <laughs> Thank you. Please join me in thanking all of our wonderful friends.